right, so good afternoon, everybody, and happy World Oceans Day to all of you. Thank you so, so much for joining us in this epic celebration all week long as we feature a series of incredible scientists and explorers from across Canada and a few across the globe for good measure. If you joined us just yesterday, we had a four-part slate of incredible programs. We got the chance to chat with Jill Heiner talking about underwater Canada, Boris Worm about sharks, talk about the UN Decade and Environmental Register. Uh, I've forgotten the word. My brain's a little fried. <laughs> UN Decade and Environmental Restoration with the Friends of the Rouge Watershed and Cross the Oceans with Erd and Eric. So it's a really, really special first day to kick off Oceans Week. And if you want to learn more about our programs and all sorts of festivities going on all week long, check out OceanWeekCan.ca. Today, we are diving in on one of our favorite topics here at Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants, and that is ocean plastics. Typically, we spend the entire month of September and quite a bit of June talking about this because it's something that we all recognize is a big issue and we all recognize we can do something about. And so before I dive in with our speaker, I want to stress a few things. Uh, we've got tons of you folks joining on YouTube too. Welcome in from across Canada, across the US and internationally. Such a pleasure to have you here. Because the chat gets a bit unwieldy with this many kids, I want to encourage everyone to go to slido.com and use the event code PLASTIC. So we're going to have a few interactive elements of today's presentation. You'll be able to take part in them there, so some quizzes that will come up, and you'll be able to share questions and upvote your favorites throughout the course of the broadcast. So slido.com, event code plastic to take part in a really fun way. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to our speaker today. We are joined live by Dwight Owens of Ocean Networks Canada, and he's going to talk to us today about sea of plastic, trash in our oceans, why this is an issue, how it came to be, and what we can do to stop it. So I'm really excited to welcome in Dwight. Dwight, thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you, Jesse. I'm so happy to be here uh, again because I was, I think it was in October or September oh, yeah. last year, and uh, it was wonderful that today is World Ocean Day. And, you know, we're transitioning to World Ocean Week, so this is uh, yeah. not even hump day of World Ocean <laughs> Week yet. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's so exciting. One of the things we talked about earlier today, we had a program with Richard Garriott, and Joe was talking about the fact that I think if there's one topic that really unites kids around the world is that we recognize the importance of our oceans. It's 70% of our planet. It's where so much biodiversity lives, and it, it really dictates a lot of what happens here on land. And so it, it's... Again, you said it's gone from a day to a week to a month and beyond. Uh, and whether you're on a coast or whether you're in the middle of a continent, what you do can affect the oceans and what happens in the oceans affects you. And so I'm really happy to have you here to chat about this amazing topic today. <laughs> Absolutely, I'm, I'm, I'm very honored and happy to be with all of you and talk to you about uh, trash in our oceans. And um, you know, there's some questions that we can think about. For example, how much trash is there that's going into the oceans? And where do you find it? Also, what kinds of trash can we find in our oceans? And what are the impacts on ecosystems, on organisms living in the oceans? And finally, you know, what can we do about this problem? And you know, the good news about plastics and trash is we're part of it. Like we touch these things every day. So we're part of the solution. And in fact, many good things are already happening all around the world and all across Canada. So before I start, I would just like to acknowledge with respect the Lekwungen peoples within whose traditional ter territory I live and the Songhees, Esquimalt and Wasainich peoples whose historical relationships with the land and the ocean continue to this day. Now there's a teaching from the Tsawat and Tsartlet people who live up the peninsula from where I am. And they teach us that people are linked to the land. The four winds, the trees, the birds, the animals, and the fish were all people long ago. Nature, animals, fish, fire, and water are imbued with spiritual values that have the power to heal, to give life, provide bounty and guidance. And you know, to me, it's, it's quite interesting to think about this idea that the birds, the trees, the animals, the fish were all people long ago. Now, I live near the ocean, but I wasn't born near the ocean. I was born, born in the mountains far, far away from the ocean. And I didn't think about it much when I was a kid, but somehow I've long been attracted to the oceans. And being near the water wakens... Uh, 
a wild instinct in me, makes me feel more alive. And so now it's uh, incredible that I work for Ocean Networks Canada. So we operate these deep sea observatories. We put these uh, cables and super accurate scientific instruments way down on the bottom of the ocean and in the ocean. And we're measuring the data that's coming from the ocean in real time, 24 seven, 365. So, you know, the oceans uh, mean a lot to me, but I'm curious to hear from you. You know, what do the oceans really mean to you? And Jesse, can you help me? Let me know what we're hearing from Slido and, and from the classrooms. So if you're on YouTube, you want to share there, great. If you're in StreamYard with us today as a live class, you want to type your answer in, fantastic. Uh, we've got a whole bunch of answers already coming in on Slido, which is great. A place to relax, life, joy, everything uh, means a whole lot to me. These are some great answers, guys. Love to swim in it, love the animals. Uh, so a whole bunch of stuff coming in, which is awesome. Uh, great question, Dwight. <laughs> Okay, great. Well, I'm, I'm super glad to hear this. And I want to share with you some words from Dr. Sylvia Earle. So this is Dr. Earle and she, I think she was on Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. Just, was it this week or last week, Jesse? She was uh, a while back now. I think we had, we had her during the BioFest, which was fantastic. And a little bit before that in partnership with the Hearts and the Ice Ladies. It was part of our sort of all-star time with Jane Goodall as well. So a really exciting series a few weeks back. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, um, she has been a spokesperson for the ocean her entire life and an explorer. And in fact, when she was younger, she spent six months in this Atlantis sea base under the water with some other scientists. And in fact, in the bottom of this sea base, there's a moon pool. It's like open to the water. And so in the morning, she could just put on her scuba equipment and jump into the moon pool and go out exploring and doing her research uh, underwater. So several years ago, Dr. Earl won the TED Prize. And I recommend to everybody to watch this um, talk by Dr. Earl, uh, which you can find on YouTube and on TED. And I have a clip from Dr. Earl that I'm gonna play, but unfortunately the sound is not working perfectly today. So while she's talking, I'm going to sort of narrate what she says, and we'll see how this goes. Good luck. She, she says that the poet Auden said that, you know, many may live without love, but none of us could live without water. And then she's talking about the importance of the earth. Without the ocean, um, you know, our Earth might be like Mars, a planet with very little water and just frozen up. She gave a talk at the World Bank. She showed these pictures of the planet and she said, that's the World Bank. That's where all the assets are. And unfortunately, we've been drawing down our assets, our natural assets in the ocean much faster than they can uh, be regenerated by the ocean. But every every breath we take, every time we uh, drink a drop of water, we're connected to the ocean. Most of the oxygen in the atmosphere is actually generated by phytoplankton and, and algae and seaweed living in the ocean. And the ocean is this incredible system that drives the weather and the, planet, um, the climate of our planet. Uh, the ocean forms clouds that bring water to the land that returns to the ocean and provides home to 97% of life on the planet. And at, at the end, Dr. Earl su summarizes by saying, no water, no life, no blue, no green. And I think that's such a uh, very simple um, but profound way of, of summing it up, the importance of the ocean. Now I have a question for you. Where do you think this is? Again, if anyone wants to pop in where they think this is, uh, in the chat, in StreamYard, it's not a Slido question for us today. We've got some bigger questions for those coming up later, and there's only so many we can add in. But if you guys have a thought about where this is, standing on that big pile of trash, by all means, throw it into the chat. No one's biting so far, right? Africa, we've got, very broad. 
I like it. We got a whole continent today. <laughs> Giant continent. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Hawaii, uh, the U.S. What have we got? Uh, coast of the United States. Also, another continent. A river. What do you think, Dwight? <laughs> well, you know those are good tries, but they're wrong. This Jesse is actually at Mount Everest. Uh, it's one of the base camps at Mount Everest, and they have a trash problem there. And you know, it it makes you kind of wonder, like, are there any trash-free places left on Earth? And in the case of the oceans, definitely not trash-free. So uh, here's just another little clip from Dr. Earl's um, TED Talk. And here she's talking about how we're putting hundreds of millions of tons of trash and plastic into the ocean, discarded fishing nets, and gear that continues to kill. We are clogging the uh, circulatory system of our ocean. So I'm gonna show you a bunch of things about trash and plastic in our ocean. And I want each one of you to find one thing that you will remember and one thing that you will do as a result. So when we get to the end, I'd like to ask you, what is it that you're gonna remember what could you tell your family about this? And what is one thing that you could do? Now, an estimated 8 million tons of plastic are going into the ocean every year. And that is enough to line up five grocery bags of trash on every foot of coastline in the world. So that's an incredible amount of trash. And it's not like it's all being dumped on the beaches. Much of this trash comes from the land, from, from the streams that flow into the rivers, that flow into bigger rivers, that flow into the ocean. So when we discard some trash near our home, the water may carry it into the ocean. Now I have here a clip, this is from Indonesia. And this is um, a river in Jakarta, which is the capital of Indonesia. This river, it. Uh, there's a woman here and a couple people are going on this boat down the river and it might look kind of normal until you start looking carefully at the shoreline. And in fact, all along the shoreline is plastic. Those are all plastic bags, just meters and meters deep, piled up, and huge heaps of them and that have been discarded and got into the river and what she's talking about here is how it's just so frustrating that, um, you know, the message that, that people get is, you know, we need to manage this better. We need to recycle. We need to deal with this trash better. But what her point is, is that you can't manage this. It, there's just so much. Look at these two guys and they're trying to use a net to get out a little bit of trash when the entire two sides, shorelines of this river are just totally covered with trash. So, you know, the real issue is that we're using plastics and these other materials to create stuff that becomes trash almost instantly. We basically, we treat trash like it's worthless or we treat plastic like it's trash, like it's worthless. And there's this whole industry that is creating plastic for throwing away. So her, her main point here is that the, uh, you know, prevention begins at the source. So Jesse, if you could come to me for a moment here, I, I just have a question for everyone. This is not on Slido, but imagine you go home, and you go to the washroom and you look and the water's running in the sink. In fact, both taps are open. The water's running. Not only that, the sink is clogged and the water has filled the sink and it's flowing over and it's flowing down onto the floor. In fact, it's several inches deep on the floor. It's completely submerged the floor. It's going out into the hallway. The, the carpet is soaked. So what are you going to do? And is there, what's the first thing that you're going to do? Can anybody answer that? 
Yeah, we got turn off the tap for Mr. Shadis class. <laughs> exactly, exactly. First thing, turn off the tap. After that, you know, deal with the mess. So it's the same thing with this plastic pollution. First, we have to stop it, you know, from getting into the oceans, and then we have to figure out how to deal with it. There was a study from the World Economic Forum. I'm coming back to my slideshow, Jesse. And they found that if we keep, keep going the way we're going right now with overfishing, too much fishing, and too much trash going into the ocean, that by the year 2050, there could be more plastic than fish in our world's oceans. So just think about that for a minute. More plastic than trash. You know, is that the kind of ocean we want? Is that the future we want? So here's a question for Slido and for everyone. You know, where can you find trash, plastic trash in the ocean? And Jesse, I'll ask you to let me know what you see coming in. Absolutely. I've also got a, a story from our earlier program today for Oceans Day that I'm, I'm hoping and I'm curious if any of our classes will hit upon in their answers, but if you guys want to highlight where you can find plastic trash, there's so almost everywhere, Pacific Garbage Patch, good job, near the shore, deep down on the shorelines, um, the Red Sea, uh, top layer, inside animals, so a little bit of everywhere, which is really, really cool. Um, and I don't want to steal your thunder this is part of your talk, but we have Richard Garriott on earlier today, who is one of the few people ever to go to the deepest part of the deepest ocean on this planet, and one of the things he showcased was the trash that was down there which is wild. So not an answer that we got in our Slido, but I think a really important note for this. And Dwight, if you wanted to carry us on after those great answers, that would be awesome. Yeah, I think, um, you know, all, all of you nailed the answers here. You can find trash on the, on the beaches, on the shorelines. You can find it floating on the surface of the ocean. You can also find it drifting, submerged in the water column. You can find it, just as you mentioned, Jesse, way down in the, on the sea floor even in the deepest oceans. And as someone mentioned, you can find it inside of the sea animals, the birds and the whales and the dolphins and the fish. They may have plastic inside of their stomachs and inside of their bodies. Now, this map here, or these four maps, are showing the distributions of plastic by size. And so it's a, it's a world map. And you see there's four panels. And the top two panels, one of them on the upper left is showing particles of plastic from a third up to one millimeter in size. And the second panel is showing from one up to five millimeters in size. So the point being, all these red and orange areas are places where there's 10,000, 100,000, up to a million pieces of plastic, tiny pieces of plastic per square kilometer. Now, uh, Jesse, just as you mentioned, the Mariana Trench, the deepest place in our ocean. Uh, this is 10, almost 11 kilometers deep. And this place, Challenger Deep, and when the explorers went down there not too long ago, they found these discarded fiber optic umbilicals, in fact, creating a hazard so that other explorers can't really even go to this place now for safety reasons. So uh, here's a, a very interesting organism. It's called the Eurythines plasticus. And this is a new, a new species of deep sea amphipod that was discovered in one of the deepest places on earth, six to uh, seven kilometers deep this amphipod lives. And when the uh, biologists examined this organism, they looked inside its, its tissues, inside its body, and they found that there was plastic inside this amphipod. So that's why they named it the Erythines plasticus. So then we have a questions about what kinds of plastic are littering our ocean. And I'm, uh, instead of pausing here, Jesse, I'm just gonna go forward. And what we have are a variety of different types of plastic, like the foams, styrofoam that we can find on beaches, and filaments like uh, fishing nets. And in fact, uh, fishing debris comprise 20% of all marine debris. Things like balled up fishing line, 
ghost nets. What's a ghost net, Jesse? Wow. Any anybody? Does anyone have a ghost net idea? I, I thought you were asking me personally. I know what a ghost net is. Probably <laughs> 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 ghost nets. Um, but if anyone has a thought in the chat, oh, what do we think? Oh, we got one in the private chat here. A whole net that has fallen overboard. I like that. Potential answer. Really thin net. I like that with a ghost. That's fun. <laughs> Thanks, kind net. No, tell us. Discarded fishing net from our SDG warriors in India. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. These these are nets that have been lost at sea, but they continue to trap animals. So turtles and seals and fish and other animals that may be trapped in these nets, even though uh, the fishermen will never re recover this lost net. So that's why it's called a, a ghost net. Now here is a very large baleen whale and it's got fishing gear wrapped around its tail. And fortunately, the diver was able to cut, the, uh, cut these nets off and free this whale. But can you imagine how hard it would be to swim with this stuck around your tail? Uh, there are a lot of pictures you can find of seals and other animals trapped in fishing debris. Here's a gray seal and here's a ring seal. And I don't know how long that rope was wrapped around its body, but you can see it's been bleeding, so it must be very painful. Here's a sea turtle that had this, uh, I think it's a rubber or a plastic strap wrapped around its shell and it kept growing and the whole shell is deformed. Uh, must have been very difficult for that turtle. Here's another type of plastic. Uh, what we call films or, you know, the kind of thin sheets of plastic, like plastic bags. And and when you look at this picture, does it remind you of something? I'd like to know, Jesse, if, if the audience is reminded of something here. Yeah, what do you guys think? Does anyone see these plastic bags in the water and does it bring up any memories or thoughts for you guys? I think some of our classes might know this. We've covered this topic a bit. Uh, Miss Mason's class in our, our live group, uh, Jellyfish, which, uh, you know, we don't need to sugarcoat it. That's the right answer. <laughs> Yeah. Exactly, jellyfish. And, you know, the thing is that sea turtles have been eating jellyfish for millions of years, like much longer than we've been a species on the planet. And so when they counter plastic bags and think it's a jellyfish, that could be a problem. Or what if, you know, what if we, we get a nice, beautiful balloon, a helium balloon, and we, we're at the beach and then we just let that balloon go and it goes off into the ocean. You know, what might happen to that balloon? I think it could be a problem if it turns out that a turtle ate it and that balloon is stuck inside of its stomach. Now here's another type of plastic, the fragments, the different colors and sizes of broken down bits and pieces of plastic we can find on any shoreline anywhere around the world. And here's another type, the nurdles. These are industrial plastic pellets. And the, the, it's, it's like a feeder stock that's used, it's shipped to different factories and then they melt it down and they form it into products. But sometimes there are spills of these nurdles and they just spread out and you can find them on beaches all around the world. And when you look at these uh, little nurdles, do they remind you of something? I think they kind of remind me of eggs. I know we're at the 25 minute mark and you got a bit more to cover. So I'll, I'll, I'll throw out eggs into the world and you can tell me if I'm right. Okay, Jesse, thanks for the reminder on the time. Yeah. So exactly right. Eggs, uh, there's little numbers on this chart. These are different types of zooplankton and the number eight there is a fish egg. And the number six is a little uh, larvae of a snail. So these different uh, zooplankton are eaten by large animals, by whales, or by could be by manta rays. Here's a manta ray that is swimming in water off of Indonesia. And you can see that there's just so much plastic and trash. So it makes you wonder, you know, as these manta rays are trying to feed, how much plastic are they eating? And what are the impacts of the plastic on them? Now, here are some sea squirts. These were discovered on the, off the coast of Israel. And when the 
uh, researchers looked into the sea squirts tissues. They find found high levels of phthalate, aster, or acid esters, PAEs, which are sort of a like a plasticizer. It's an additive to plastics to make them more flexible, more plasticky. And unfortunately, um, they're an uh, endocrine system disruptor when they get into our bodies and the bodies of animals. Here are some northern fulmers who live very, very, very far north in the Arctic. But the researchers found there were phthalates in their eggs. And so these are having impacts all around the world, even in Siberia. Some um, Russian scientists found that polar bears were eating a lot of plastic because it's in the seals and in the fish that they feed on. Now, the good news is that plastic is very durable. And I think that's a good thing because, you know, there's lots of plastic products like my glasses or my uh, mobile phone or parts of my computer. I want those to last a long time. Many things we want to last long and they're made out of plastic and that's great. But the bad news is that plastic is very durable. And the thing is that we, um, we use plastic to create products. And some of these products maybe shouldn't be made out of plastic. Now, in the case of this foamed buoy, uh, that this could last 50 years in the marine environment. That seems like a good idea. Seems like very useful. But do you want your styrofoam cup to be there 50 years later after it gets discarded? Do we really want fishing line to last 600 years in the marine environment? That's much longer than the lifespan of a, of a fisherman. Or plastic bags we may use for 10 to 20 minutes and then it remains in the marine environment for 20, 10 to 20 years. Plastic bottles may be able to remain 450 years in the marine environment or these, these beverage holders, maybe 400 years. This next one is the craziest of all, diapers. You know, 450 years. These are products that are designed to be thrown away, right? And so why do we make them out of materials? that are gonna last 450 years. I think the, um, the people of the future, and even you, the youth of today, have just got to be shaking your head and wondering, what are we thinking? The way we've uh, made these choices in our society. Now this map here is showing uh, Midway Island. It's that red pointer. There's a big white arrow pointing to it. This island is about halfway, about midway between Japan and California. And it's a pretty small island. Not very many people live there, but uh, quite a few birds uh, make their nests there. The albatrosses in particular and other seabirds. And this is a very, very important nesting ground for these birds. So uh, they make their nests, raise their chicks here, and then the albatrosses go out to sea to find food that they bring back and feed their chicks. But unfortunately, what's happening is they're feeding their chicks a lot of garbage because the albatrosses don't know the difference. And these albatrosses are dying with stomachs that are full of trash. This one here, if you look at this skeleton, you can see that this albatross died with a cigarette lighter and bottle caps and other sharp pieces of plastic in its stomach. And you know, that's got to be super uncomfortable. But on top of that, there's not much, much space left for food. So the, the, the chicks and the, the birds will starve with their bellies full of, of garbage. So it's, it's a hard thing to see, but this is the reality. So now I wanna ask you a question. And this, I think this is in Slido, Jesse. It's, uh, you know, what simple changes could you make in your life to address this issue? 
All right, we got Andrew Stern to come in. If anyone wants to share on YouTube as well, um, quite the last little story. You really impacted a lot of our kids tuning in today, Dwight. So that's the, the point of all of this, which is fantastic. We've got uh, recycle, uh, could reuse, stop throwing plastic in the water, um, burn garbage. Um, yeah, a lot of I could reuse seems to be the biggest thing uh, that's popping up, which is fantastic. So a lot of people are sharing that as an, an answer. Um, I think the three R's is something that was a really big thing when I was a kid, and that's carried on. And that essence seems to permeate a lot of our answers today, which is great. All right, wonderful. Okay, so we, we've got those, and I'll show um, some of those things and a few more things to give you some ideas. And there's so many things we can do, but I think it all starts really with don't litter, right? Don't splash your trash. And you know, this is where it starts. If we litter or if our family or friends or people we know or don't know if they litter, that trash could end up in the stream, in the river and getting into the ocean. And you know, we can change some things we do. Instead of using plastic bags that may, you know, only we only use for a few minutes, we could switch to cloth bags that are reusable. You can use for years and years. And that's a, uh, you know, a wonderful thing. Now, Jesse, I have a little video clip, but um, I think in the interest of time and because our audio is not working, I'll have to skip this. But these are kids at a school in, you know, where I live in Victoria who came up with 10 ways to help their families remember to bring the cloth bags when they go shopping because it's easy to forget. And you know maybe that's a class project to figure out uh, ways to, ch to change our, our memory and change our habits. Here's another thing. Um, you know, instead of these plastic diapers that may be around 450 years from now, if we know somebody, some family that has a little baby, maybe they could use cloth diapers. They can be washed, they can be reused. They're stylish. They've got little campers on them and cars. That's pretty cool. Instead of this, um, you know, plastic bottle with soap in it, soap dispenser that you use up and you have to throw away, how about just soap without the, the dispenser? Hand soap it works just as good. And um, there's no leftover um, mess to clean up. Instead of these forks, plastic forks, plastic knives, plastic spoons, plastic everything that we get offered when we go out to places, maybe we could take our own little kit. This is a kit that I have, and it all folds up. I can put it in my backpack. And when I go somewhere and they offer me, a, you know, would you like a, a, some, a fork and a spoon? I say, no, I've got my own, thanks. So, you know, we can do this, right? Now these are K-cups, which are these little pods that are used to make um, coffee or tea or different drinks. And the drinks are, are great, all kinds of delicious drinks. But the problem is the cups, because you, you make a, a drink and then you have to throw away the pod and the amount of K-cups that have been trashed could, could wrap around planet Earth 10 times. It's crazy. And you know, instead of this, if you have some coffee drinkers in your family, you could encourage them to switch to a French, something like a French press, which makes delicious coffee and with no, no plastic residue, residue to throw away. Instead of these plastic bottles that may last for 450 years, we can take our own uh, drinking bottle and more and more of us are doing this. And instead of these straws that you find everywhere on beaches and stir sticks all around the world, how about a metal straw? These are something you can buy, you can clean it. There's little tiny uh, brushes you can use to clean these and reuse them. Instead of getting your ice cream in a styrofoam cup, how about getting your ice cream on a cone? I mean, that's why it's called an ice cream cone and the, the cones are delicious, you can eat them. So for me, that's always the best part. And Jesse, you talked about the three R's and some people talk about the five R's, reduce, reuse, reform, recycle, refuse. And among these, I think refuse is, is really important and very powerful because 
all of us have the choice to say yes or no, you know, and we can say no thanks. If there's uh, something that, uh, some plastic thing, single use plastic thing that we don't need to say, okay, we can say no thanks. Now, as important as it is to change our habits, it's also important to change the laws. And this is happening all around the world. There are 69 countries that are taking action on plastic bags, 40 countries, many provinces and states have bottle deposit systems. So that's great. Now, maybe our governments could do something about these companies that uh, produce the, the throwaway plastic. I'm not saying the plastic's bad, I'm saying the single use is a problem. And you know, some of these biggest companies that make this stuff, Coca-Cola, PepsiCo, Nestle, um, Exxon, Dow, these are companies that our government could ask to help be part of the solution, help us to uh, reduce the throwaway plastic and use plastic for something that's very useful over a long period of time. So here's a question for, um, for all of us, and I think it's on Slido, Jesse, is how could you convince your government to do something more about plastic trash? Yep. We've already got a whole bunch of answers coming in uh, to ban plastic, show the problem to them, petitions, protests, Fridays for future. Great answer. I love that for people who don't know what that's all about. Um, send in mail uh, to, to write them a letter. So, uh, and votes is, is one of the big ones coming up, which is fantastic. So great, great group of answers, guys. That's great. You know, um, well, I'm wondering how many of our audience are voting age, but you know, you're, somebody in your family can vote. And uh, someone, your, someone in your family can contact your elected leader and say, you know, I'll vote for you if you do something about this, this problem. And another thing that some kids have done, and this is an awesome thing, Jesse, if, if some of the classes who are tuned in today could do this, go to your local city council meeting. And when kids show up, it's incredible. The city council members, they're not used to it, to hear directly from, from our youth, from our kids. And when the kids speak, they really listen and it really makes an impact. I would recommend going to your local government and talking to them or have a meeting. So this is the question I asked at the beginning, what will you remember and what will you do? And I guess we have a, a few minutes here, Jesse. So maybe we can talk about this a little bit. Yeah, fantastic, Dwight. Well, what a, a, a not even a whistle stop tour. You really covered a lot of elements of the issue, which is really special. Highlighted some amazing videos, and we'll make sure if people do want to check out that Sylvia Earl video or anything else, they can reach out to me, and we'll get them that. Um, we've got about seven, eight minutes left. So what I want to do is, is head to our, our live classes, uh, see if we can have some questions from them, maybe. And if you guys, as classes, want to figure out what you can do too, by all means, share. We've had so many answers come in the chat, which is amazing. So you can. Check the YouTube chat for days, Dwight, and see some answers of classes as well. Um, our SDG warriors joining all the way in Bangalore and India have mentioned the plastic problem is a monster. If we don't tackle us, it will wrap us. Take action and be the change, which is an awesome message for all our students today. Um, and so, yes, we'll go to our live groups. If you have questions or comments of what you want to do, come on either way. Mr. Shattuck, you can kick us off from Chalk River, Ontario. Come on in, Mr. Shattuck. Hi. Hi there. Thank you, Dwight, for a great presentation, uh, especially like cheering about that that extra hour of refuse. I'm wondering, we're in a very, you know, landlocked area in comparison to the ocean. And obviously, you've shown us some of the impacts on marine life and animals there. What would be um, maybe some of the impacts to those of us who are inland on on the, the, the plastic problem in the oceans? How does that translate into those of us who aren't near the oceans? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, um, as Dr. Silver, Sylvia Earl was reminding us, the, the oceans really are, um, they're connected to us with every breath we take. And the health of the ocean really is, is connected to our own health, whether we live next to the ocean, in the ocean, or far from the ocean. So when our plastics from, uh, you know, somewhere in Ontario or somewhere else, far from the ocean when they get into the streams and rivers and they get into the oceans and they start to uh, interfere with the food chain and with the natural biological systems, it can disrupt the balance. 
that has evolved over millions of years in the ocean. So this disruption, it could affect our food supply. It could affect our weather even because there are uh, little zooplankton and phytoplankton that form this seeding for clouds and um, contribute to precipitation. It could affect us in many ways that we, we really can't anticipate at this time. And also, I should say, you know, the plastics in the ocean also impact the animals living in lakes and rivers, right? So you live near lakes and rivers and some of these uh, animals living in these, in these water bodies will be impacted by the plastics just as well. Fantastic. First question, guys, and great answer, Dwight. That was marvelous. Um, and again, you, you touch upon a lot of the themes that we've been covering all Oceans Week long and, and as an organization for years now. So I think that's reflected in some of our comments today. This is an issue that a lot of people know a lot about now, and they're really just looking for answers on how they can take action and help, which is wonderful. So thank you, Mr. Shattuck, for kicking us off. And a special note, I just want to thank Mr. Shattuck in general for coming into like 50 programs this year. Uh, Mr. Shattuck, you've been amazing. This might be the last time we get the chance to chat. Thank so you. thank you so much. <laughs> For your class and your enthusiasm, it's been amazing. So I really appreciate Thank it. Thank you so much. Awesome. All right, guys, three minutes to go officially. We're going to be rebels and go a little past time, I think. Uh, but Mr. Pettix joining us in North Hollywood, California. Come on in, your, your third graders. Hey. Hi, hello, hi hello. there. How are you? Um, we have uh, David that wanted to know. He's way back there. He's waving. Um, hey, David. If there's an estimate of how much plastic is already in our oceans. There is an estimate. Uh, it's in the hundreds of millions of tons, but I don't know the exact number. So I'm going to have to, I'll write that down and I'll send that to Jesse along with the links uh, to, to try and get an estimated number. But, you know, part of the problem is we actually don't know because uh, there's so much that's buried under the sediment and under the, you know, beaches in the coastlines. So the total amount is, is not known, but there are estimates. Yeah, I, you know, it's one of those things you mentioned earlier too, which really impacted the YouTube chat with this idea of a bunch of garbage bags in every you know foot of shoreline. That is astonishing to think about. And it's, you know, I think it's something that we can all recognize as such a problem. And I think if nothing else, that is the best thing about plastic pollution is that no one looks at a beach covered in plastic and goes great. No one sees a turtle where they've been captured in plastic and their shells malformed and they go, oh, how fantastic. We all recognize this is an issue and we can all do something about it which I think is, is a really positive story. But yes, Mr. Pettix, we'll, we'll try and get you that info as, as soon as we can after the broadcast. Um, Ms. Mason's class, I know you guys were in a bit of tech difficulties earlier, so if you want to come on in, uh, let's see if we can get you guys in. And then Mr. St. Amand, in a minute, we'll wrap up with you. So Ms. Mason, good, you're back. <laughs> hey. We're great, thank you. Um, thank you so much. Uh, a couple students have related questions. So one, uh, when the animal eats the plastic, they can't pass it. Uh, or they said they can't poop out the plastic and, and why can't they? So they're not digesting it. And then if it's in them, is it then safe for us to eat? Perhaps like in a fish, is it safe for us to eat the fish? Yeah, so, you know, it, it all depends on how big the plastic is and the shape of it and what kind of animal is eating it. So a lot of plastic is, you know, passed through their system. But while it's going through their digestive system, it's possible that they are absorbing these phthalates, these uh, chemical additives to the plastic, and that would be absorbed into their bodies. So maybe the, the you know, plastic form, the polyethylene gets pooped out, and, but these uh, additives might be part, become part of their tissue. Now with some animals, because of the shape, and we saw with the albatrosses, uh, they have a, like a, big gullet and they can swallow large things, but uh, they just can't digest it. They can't uh, pass it out in any way. So they really will suffer from that. So that's a, you know, in that situation, it's, it's really unfortunate for the animals. And there have been whales that have died that have been found with hundreds and hundreds of plastic bags and flip flops and all kinds of bottle caps and things inside their stomachs. So things get stuck there and it's just a big problem. I mean, you, you show that image of the albatross and it's become one of the iconic images of conservation in the world. I think we, you know, we're seeing more and more of these things around the world. There's so much that we can do personally, whether again, refusing, and that's another thing you, you, you mentioned, it was in the YouTube chat a lot. Uh, when you go to a store, when you go to a restaurant, 
you know, deny that plasma. You don't need necessarily everything. You don't need a tray. Those things do make a big difference if they add up if, if a lot of people do them. So we can avoid images like that and, and impacts like that on the ecosystem. Uh, Mr. Sam Ons class, uh, to wrap us up with one more question. Thanks so much, man, for coming on in. Just unmute your mic and you are good to go. Oh, unmute your mic. Sorry, Mr. J. <laughs> Video call bingo. We have to have a, a muted mic at some point. <laughs> I right. had to be that guy. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> thanks, Dwight, and thanks, Jesse, so much. Um, just going to sort of echo what Mrs. Mason asked there. Um, just thinking about the whole cycle. It goes into the water, into fish, and you showed some really, you know, jarring images. I'm just wondering what the impact on us is, though. Um, if it's in our water and drinking our water, if it's in the fish and we're eating fish, uh, interacting, um, what, what's kind of the human impact as it, as it goes beyond, you know, what we see in the sea? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, you know, I think some of these, these impacts aren't really known very well. Um, uh, this, this uh, question about the PAEs, the phthalates and the other additives to the plastics, they are endocrine system disruptors. So they will mess up with our hor hormonal systems. And so if they're in the fish that we eat, um, then they'll get into us, right? And um, if you understand the concept of like a, a food pyramid or a food chain where um, one animal may eat, a small animal may eat many, many tiny animals, and then a larger animal may, you know, the, the pollutants then gets concentrated. So in, when you get to fish or, or other larger animals, they might have higher um, concentrations of these chemicals in their tissues. So this could be a health impact of concern for humans. Um, and then, you know, there's the general concern. If we're disrupting our natural systems, our ecosystems, throwing them out of balance, not just from plastics, from global warming, from all the many different uh, things that we're doing, that's going to have a rebound effect. You know, when you disrupt these food systems, these ecosystems, it's going to have some impacts back to humans because we're part of it, right? We're part of this global system. So I don't know if that gets at your question or... Yeah, maybe not. I think, that, you know, it's something that increasingly a lot of teachers, a lot of kids and people around the world are really thinking about. like, how does this impact us? We, we can see that an animal has ingested a bunch of plastic and died is tragic, but how does it ultimately feed back to us? And I think that that's a, a great answer for it. It's something that we're going to be covering through the rest of Oceans Week as well, if people are keen to learn more. And of course, uh, you know, over like 250 broadcasts plus on our YouTube channel uh, on green plastics, on conservation, on the ocean. So if you're keen on anything, they're all there. They remain up forever, uh, including this one. So if people want to check it out again, or if there's anything they missed, they can. Uh, Dwight, uh, time flies and you're having fun. So we're, we're nearing the end of the broadcast, but I, I just want to thank you so, so much for your time today, your enthusiasm, energy, and, and, and you know, wide wellspring of knowledge. This has been really impactful for our kids. And, and I appreciate the interactivity elements too. That was really special. And we got some great answers from our classrooms today. <laughs> thank you so much, Jesse. I'm, I'm super happy to be here. Super happy that uh, people are interested in World Ocean Week, World Ocean Day, and that, you know, people are ready and willing and taking action. And, uh, you know, we can make a better future. Yeah, fantastic. I, I think our kids are certainly on that train. So uh, for all our students today, the future is with you guys. Uh, there's never been a generation that's been more active in understanding some of the problems facing our planet and really keen to, to enact those solutions. So kudos to you all today. I hope that you get to tune in for the rest of Oceans Week and take some really good action in the months and years to come to make a positive difference. If you guys want to check out our, more, our other Ocean Week programs, oceanweekcan.ca or join us at exploringbytheseat.com slash oceanweek. Dwight, as we do at the end of every broadcast, I'm going to bring in all our, our teachers to say a big thank you and farewell. So Mr. Shattuck, Mr. Fedick, Ms. Mason, Mr. Simon, well, thanks, guys.